Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on your location. This is Una Daly from the Open Courseware Consortium. And welcome to um, Open Education Week. And um, our webinar um, today is Designing OER with Diversity in Mind. And it's my pleasure to have Anna Grzynska from Sheffield Hallam University in the UK and Yuta Treverianis from OTAD University in Canada, both who are experts on um, the accessibility of OER. And um, if you are logging in with us today on the Collaborate system, I just want to point out that uh, your audio and video controls are up at the top left, and um, everything sounds fine now, so I won't go into that. Um, the participant list is down the left-hand side of your screen, and you should see your name in there um, if you are logged in. And um, you can also use the chat window, which is uh, directly underneath there. Uh, to send questions to our presenters or to make comments in general about um, today's session. So if you haven't had a chance yet, uh, please do introduce yourself in the chat window. Uh, let us know what institution you're with um, and, or organization and um, what your interest is in OER. And I, I just wanted to take a minute to introduce um, our, our panelists this morning. Um, uh, Dr. Anna Grzynska, um, as I mentioned, is from Sheffield Hallam University in the UK, and she has been involved with a number of projects um, in the UK on Open Educational Resources Program uh, throughout 2009 to through 2012, where they focused on issues around academic practice, teacher education, and accessibility. And um, I think she's going to type in. Um, her wiki page for if you would like to see more information about the research that she's done on this and that she will be talking with us about today. And she is currently working as a project manager in the Human Resources Department at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, we also have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Yuta Treverianis with us uh, today. She's the director of the Inclusive Design Research Center and a professor at OCAD University in Toronto, uh, Canada. The center conducts proactive research and development in the inclusive design of emerging ICT with a pioneering focus on personalization as an approach to accessibility in the digital domain. Yuta also heads the Inclusive Design Institute, a multi-university regional center of expertise on inclusive design uh, where they have created broadly implemented technical innovations that support inclusion. Some of these projects include fluid Project, Fluid Engage, Culture All, Stretch, Flow, and others. And uh, she has also played a leading role in developing accessibility legislation standards and specifications internationally. Um, Anna or Anna or Yuta, would you like to add anything else? Just uh, just to mention that uh, I'll be uh, popping the uh, uh, the address uh, to the wiki, which uh, hosts information about my accessibility related research, into the chat window if anybody's interested. Yes, thank you. All right. Um, so I just want to give you a, a little bit of background um, about myself as well. Um, as I mentioned, um, I. Um, work at the Open Courseware Consortium, um, and my focus is the community colleges. And um, we know um, within the United States uh, that 50% um, of post-secondary students with disabilities um, come to our community colleges. So the issue of accessibility is a very critical one for us at the community college because um, such um, a large percentage of students do come to us, and it's really our responsibility to support them. Um, prior to um, joining the Open Courseware Consortium, um, I worked with community colleges on the College Open Textbooks project, and there um, I led a project where we evaluated 100 open textbooks, and I, we did this in concert with uh, Virtual Ability and Nobility, who are um, organizations who are experts in accessibility. And the, I'll talk a little more about those reviews in a moment, but they are available on the web um, to um, inform faculty uh, about um, 
the accessibility of open textbooks um, as they're browsing for these and trying to select them for their classes. So our agenda today, um, I'm going to give you a little. Whoops, excuse me. I'm going to go give you a little bit of um, motivation around needs, and then um, we'll go directly to uh, Dr. Grzynska and hear about her accessibility research. And um, and then thirdly, we will hear from Yuta, uh, Dr. Treverianus, about um, the inclusive design for learning and the work that she does at her center. And uh, then we will open this up to questions. But please do type questions in the chat window as we go along, and we'll answer those as we can um, for you. Um, and some we, of course, will hold to the end if, if that's more appropriate. So going through a little bit of an overview here, um, open educational resources. Um, this is from the Hewlett Foundation in concert with UNESCO. Um, they are defined as teaching, learning, or research materials that are in the public domain or released under an intellectual property license that allows their free use, adaption, and distribution. And of course, uh, examples of this are, are quite varied. Um, we, of course, we highlight often open textbooks, open courses, uh, videos, uh, but really it's any tools, materials, or techniques used to support ready access to knowledge. And the characteristics of OER that, that really uh, are important to think about as we're um, going forward with this idea of accessible OER is they're, they're created digitally. Uh, which usually means they're easy to modify and free to distribute. Uh, once again, that open license allows um, uh, faculty and or students to be able to reuse them, revise them, remix them, and redistribute. And they're low cost, which means it lowers barriers to education, not only for students with disabilities, but also students um, who around affordability. So um, in general, lowers the barriers. But what we end up with this conundrum that um, having a digital resource with an open license doesn't mean that it's necessarily accessible uh, to students with um, disabilities or diverse learning needs. And so that's really um, kind of the crux of what we'll be talking about today. So sometimes in the community colleges, you know, we have faculty say, well, you know, um, is accessibility that important um, when maybe this semester I'm teaching and there and I don't have students who um, have accessibility issues? But we we point out, of course, that um, a, a very large percentage of the students in, in the United States that are that have disabilities at the post-secondary level come directly to us. Um, this is true throughout the world. Um, Canada, um, the most recent results I had. From Canada was 14% um, of um, students 15 years or older identify as having a disability. In the United Kingdom, uh, we have numbers that are a little bit lower, but about 7.6%. Uh, the United States, 11% of po post-secondary students identify uh, as having self-identify as having a disability. And worldwide, the UN estimates that 10% of the population has a disability that could affect um, learning and other, uh, other functions. We know that this is higher, these percentages are higher in developing countries, um, that disabilities are higher um, for a number of reasons we won't speculate on today. Um, we know that there's a higher percentage in aging population as, um, as age-related ailments um, come into play. So this is, this is an important um, issue and um, affects a large percentage of the population. Um, so in terms of when we look at the learning spectrum, um, uh, cognitive learning disabilities is truly a large growing area and something that probably we've, we've only looked at in the last 20, um, 20, 30 years as brain science has really started to develop, um, and, but is, is a really growing area in terms of diverse learner needs. Sensory and motor impairments, of course, are uh, well understood um, in terms of um, in, in, in terms of those, uh, those issues. However, we're still struggling to support those, um, those learners in an effective manner. 
Um, sometimes it's country language deficits. Um, in the United States, um, we often have um, students who have English as a second language, and so they are learning English along with their courses, which um, presents challenges. And, and then we also have engagement issues for students who are, um, don't engage with the materials for um, any number of reasons. So this has been recognized throughout the world uh, that um, education must be accessible, um, and not, not only education, these are actually broader um, legislative efforts. Um, probably the, 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 the most global one, of course, was the UN Convention on Persons with Disability, which was adopted in 2006. Um, and it was the treaty that uh, on the day of its adoption had the most signatories. It had 82 countries who signed it um, prior to the actual adoption announcement. And in the United Kingdom, there is the Equality Act of 2010 that seeks to address this issue. Uh, Canada has their Human Rights Act of 1985. Um, the United States has the Americans with Disability Act, which was passed in 1990. And there was earlier legislation, the Rehabilitation Act of 73 as well. So um, there have been um, many efforts to, um, to, to um, make progress on this. So over design and guidelines, um, also of course there's been a lot of work. Um, I, I'm just pointing out very broadly the universal design for learning is, is kind of the overarching um, paradigm of um, learning that is meant to be inclusive and provides multiple means of expression, representation, and engagement for students. And I, I've put um, the URL there at the bottom of the screen um, so that you can look into that further. Um, the other very important um, global effort around the web, uh, which has been, of course, a huge piece of um, the digital learning environment over the last 10 to 15 years, um, and that has been governed by, governed by the Web Content Access Guidelines 2.0, as we call it, WCAG 2.0. And um, that is a, a, um, quite a long document in terms of the requirements. Um, and one thing I just want to point out is the poor matrix, which, um, which the um, different requirements fit into, and that's around perceivability, operability, understandability, and robustness of your educational resources. Um, Taking a more tactical look at the community colleges, um, um, particularly in California, we have a we we are very lucky to have a, a a group that supports the 112 colleges within California, and their top three accessibility must dos for any of you who are faculty authors out there are to use semantics markup within your documents. These are the styles. Um, the headers um, to make uh, your documents or your web pages readable by, um, by screen readers. Um, second point is annotate any of your non-textual items. So if you have images within your documents, your web pages, put descriptions in there so that the, they can be also read by a screen reader. Uh, for any audio or video um, components within your resources, make sure that they're captioned for those who um, and who may be hearing impaired. And finally, to label tables and other complex information so that they can be viewed or perceived in multiple ways by multiple learners. So I, I wanted to just show you an example of this open textbook accessibility review, which I mentioned earlier, where we, um, the College Open Textbooks Project uh, um, reviewed 100 open textbooks. This was about two and a half years ago. They used the poor matrix from, um, the w, from the web content access guidelines, and they evaluated these books. And you can see that they show um, how close each um, textbook got to accessibility um, in terms of full accessibility. And I will tell you that none of the textbooks were full, had 100 percent, but, but there, was a, was, there was a percentage that did quite well in terms of accessibility. And these um, reviews are available both at the collegeopentextbooks.org site, and they're also available through Merlot, um, which of course I'm sure many of you are familiar with Merlot.org, which um, is an open repository of OER and has recently added um, within the last year um, 
a whole set of accessibility descriptions around its OER um, so that um, you can, if you can go in there and add OER information or accessibility information around resources that either you've produced or you've used within your classroom. So I highly recommend you participating in that Merlot effort as well. And so finally, I just want to say that the, the, our overall goals here are to improve learning for all. And as part of that, we want to educate authors who are producing OER about the needs to design with accessibility in mind. And we want to empower faculty or students um, who are out there who are using OER um, to be aware of the accessibility requirements so that it can be inclusive for all. And now I'd like to turn this over to um, Dr. Anna Grzynska. OK, so uh, I'm going to uh, talk about my research, which uh, took place uh, in the context of the uh, JISC, the Joint Information Systems Committee funded uh, Open Educational Resources Program. Uh, and let me just uh, uh, type a link which might be of interest. Uh, for the past three years, uh, we had quite a privilege in the UK to uh, for the for the e-learning uh, body to to fund a lot of uh, innovative uh, and interesting uh, research. So. Two projects that I was involved with uh, specifically uh, and which are related to accessibility were a research fellowship on OER related accessibility issues uh, undertaken with the support of the Open University and a an ongoing uh, project uh, which is due to be completed soon, the ACT OER. Accessibility challenges and techniques for open educational resources, which which is looking across the entire UK OER program uh, and looks at investigating and improving accessibility support for OERs across a range of sectors. So, not just higher education. We're we're also looking at uh, at further further education and uh, post post 16 uh, sector more in general. So in terms of what I've been looking at and the projects that I've been involved with, uh, this has been mostly about the people and, and their approaches to, to accessibility, looking at their attitudes and how these inform the way that they approach uh, accessibility and, and what sort of barriers and enablers there are uh, to embedding accessibility within OERs. And uh, once again, as I, as I mentioned previously, all of that has been happening within uh, quite a unique and particular context of the UK Open Educational Resources Programme. So some of the uh, examples and issues I'll be talking about might be more specific to the UK context, but at the same time, uh, the, there are a number of insights and, and general conclusions that will be transferable uh, across uh, all sorts of different uh, sectors. Uh, so just to recap quickly, in terms of the definition of accessibility uh, that that the projects I was involved with relied on, um, and and I know that uh, uh, later on Utah will also t um, elaborate on uh, definitions of accessibility. But in my context, it has been the ability of web-based resources to be accessed by by everyone, including learners with with additional needs and. Uh, given that we are talking about OERs, the, the, the ethos of open education and, and open access does emphasize the need to remove educational barriers, including these related to accessibility. So the, uh, the projects that I was involved with uh, included uh, a scoping Review uh, of of the of the entire program, uh, and, and there have if you if you added up all of that, uh, 
think we're looking at 80 plus projects that were funded over the past three years to uh, create open educational resources, to release open educational resources, uh, to, to look at issues around sharing practice both within higher education and, uh, and, further, and further education. Uh, quite an innovative program. Uh, however, if you look at the ways in which accessibility was addressed within the program uh, to start with, uh, very often uh, accessibility was never mentioned. It was it was it was simply a a non issue. And if mentioned at all, uh either within project reports or uh or project plan, it was frequently positioned as something within the realm of, of good intentions which were thwarted by lack of necessary resources along the lines of uh yes, accessibility is a great idea. Uh something we would have gladly um, engaged with, but we ran out of time, we, we ran out of funding, we, we only thought about it uh, at the very end of the project. And uh, and the quote uh, from, from one of the project final reports that I've chosen uh, is, is just one of many uh, that, that you could see within the program uh, with, with somebody saying that they can see your a real potential to develop the resource to, to further meet the needs of disabled students, raise awareness of accessibility issues, issues etc. However, uh, turns out it was outside the scope of the particular project, which which is a really concerning thing to say when when talking uh, about resources whose whose aim is to broaden access uh, to to education uh, and be as inclusive as, uh, as possible. So, uh, talking about further issues that that came up uh, in the context of the work undertaken uh, so far, uh, a crucial issue seems to be that of uh, metadata and then signposting users. To, to accessible uh, practice. So, first of all, uh, repositories don't always encourage good practice, and at the same time, I'm really, really uh, pleased and encouraged to to see by what Merla has been doing over over the past year and the OER Access Project. Uh, this. The role of repositories to to act as gatekeepers of accessibility is quite crucial, given that past the point of deposit, the the resource creator and or depositor are no longer in in control of of material. So if the environment is inaccessible, then the resource essentially becomes inaccessible. So in terms of issues which which came up. Uh, most repositories uh, lack bespoke filters that would allow for easy identification of, of accessible resources. It was very difficult to search for resources that would be clearly tagged in adequate detail to, to indicate that they were indeed accessible, uh, quite possibly because users lacked the awareness or the skills to describe the resource to indicate the accessibility of features or to flag up issues which might create barriers. Uh, at the same time, there were also when accessibility description was provided, sometimes the the language was incredibly alienating uh, because if you're a sixteen year old learner and you encounter something along the lines of the learning object has been designed in, in accordance with W3C Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Pages on the side use structured semantic markup, H1 tags are used for main titles, etc. That may not be 
the kind of information that, that you're able to, to easily process uh, and act upon. So at the same at the same time, uh, one one piece of feedback uh, that came uh, from my interviews with the with the accessibility experts was that uh, the key feature of op openness is that it does allow you in the end to find something that isn't inaccessible. At the same time, uh, it would be good if the the process of finding that accessible resource uh, wasn't, wasn't so difficult. Uh, and just to give you a quick glimpse into the issues encountered, uh, as, as part of the ACT OER project, uh, we looked at uh, resources. Uh, we, we reviewed uh, a random sample of resources which had been deposited into Joram, uh, which is a UK-based uh, repository, uh, and I'm um, typing, typing the link just now. Uh, so uh, the reason why this particular repository was chosen was, was because it was a requirement of the funding of uh, project funding for the UK OER program to uh, deposit all resources uh, created uh, there. Uh, you can see the results are were quite concerning with basic accessibility uh, features and, and issues not not addressed with, with videos and audio uh, lacking uh, transcripts with very few PowerPoint uh, presentations uh, accompanied by appropriate alternative descriptions uh, with uh, presentations, uh, I mean, with, with offers of presentations not using unique uh, titles for the slides, uh, overloading slides with text using relatively small font, uh, and in terms of documents failing to use true styles um, correctly, uh, thus rendering a lot of these documents uh, quite inaccessible. And this is not to say that the Joram is is an example of particularly bad practice. There are a number of excellent resources in that repository, and, and probably if you undertook a similar review of any other educational repository, you might be looking at, uh, at similar at similar problems. This is this is just to flag up uh, the the scale of the problem and the need to to raise uh, to raise awareness. Uh, and uh and to emphasize uh that there are causes uh for concern so in terms of what could be done to address the issues which which have been identified uh, one of the one of the one of the aims of the ACT OER project has been to, uh, as the title says, uh, to look at techniques and strategies uh, for enhancing uh, accessibility of, uh, of open educational resources. And to start with, there are a number of relatively simple strategies that could greatly enhance the accessibility of OERs. And that could include using accessibility features which are embedded within software packages. Uh, I mean, personally, I find the uh, accessibility checker uh, in, uh, in the office package uh, quite, quite useful uh, for these uh, purposes. Uh, at the same time, it's really, really key to address uh, issues around resource description uh, and encourage users to, to take advantage of simple fixes such as provision of transcript for any audio and video material, ensuring that the resource is in an easily customizable format. Uh, at the same time, all of these 
uh, have to be taken uh, with the understanding that a universally accessible resource does not exist. Uh, and it's really good to see creators of an OER who engage in an honest dialogue with their learners and, and provide enough alternatives to make their learning experience just as enjoyable. Uh, and, and this is possibly and hopefully where the, where the power of the open and, and the power of the community of uh, practice um, could, be, could be exploited. Uh, and as, as mentioned previously, because of the crucial importance of repositories as, well, to an extent, gatekeepers of, uh, of practice, there is a need to address accessibility features of, of platforms where, where OERs are uh, deposited. And on that note, uh, responsibility for ensuring that open educational resources are indeed accessible should not be shifted solely onto the shoulders of the resource creators. Uh, there is a need to provide adequate support and resources, even if to, to make people more sensitive to uh, issues around uh, basic principles of, of how to use the office package, uh, basic principles around uh, providing uh, alternative description for images, etc. Uh, I mean, some of the such as such as, for instance, along the lines of, of what was mentioned by uh, by Una earlier, uh, and finally, the the other thing is that accessibility issues should not be discussed in isolation from from other OER related challenges such as copyright practices related to to sharing resources and. Accessibility should not be approached as a hurdle to be overcome, but instead seen as something that enhances the quality of the resource and, and improves uh, student experience. Uh, and on that note, uh, I mean, I'll be happy to hand over to, uh, to Yuta, uh, and, and I'd also be more than happy for people to uh, to either access the uh, presentations and uh, publications released in the context of the ACT OER project and uh, and others, uh, and to invite people to to contribute to the ACT uh, ACT OER project. We'd be more than happy uh, for uh, for people to to offer the feedback, critique, experiences, etc. Thank you, Anna. Anna. And, and, uh, uh, so, so, who knows? Should I just go ahead? Go ahead. Go ahead. Great. Um, um, so, so uh, okay. oh, my, my name, name is Yuta Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're we're having a little bit of an audio issue there. Um, oh, well, okay. Can, can you, you hear me hear now? now? Uh, we've got a bit of an echo going on. Oh dear. Okay. okay. Um, do you think that's at that my end, end or, or somewhere else? else? Yeah, it sounds a bit like a Dalek, but I don't know. Yeah, the only the, the I mean there I do we do have a dial in number, Utah, but you might want to just try to do you, you want to run through the audio configure one more time? Okay. okay. And, um, Fine, I can do that. Uh, it's under tools, or I can type the, um, if you, this is a toll-free number for Canada if you wanted to use, I believe it's toll-free, it used to be toll-free. Okay, uh, okay, so, so um, um, why don't I, I, I am, um, cancel echo between like microphone and speakers. speakers. I have that, that checked check under the, the audio, audio references. references. Okay. I can, I can uh, uh, move away from my line of text and, and try to drive those in input. input. Yes. Do you have the audio and video on your computer um, turned off? Uh, so um, 
I'm sorry, not the audio issue on your, on your computer. I meant um, you might have a microphone that's producing some sort of feedback. There's a there's a distortion going on that we didn't have earlier. So perhaps oh, you because I have not changed anything. anything. But, but what, what I can do, do is I can change the, the microphone setting that so it's the really built in and uh, input 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 here. here. Okay. Otherwise, I have put the uh, the telephone and passcode if you want to use the toll free number. All right, there was a good question there in the uh, chat window uh, from Anna, and she was asking Stephanie um, what what she means by, by the distinction between qualitative versus non-qualitative. Um, I think this is OER um, metrics. Actually, um, Una, is this any better? Oh, yes, that's much better, Yuka. Okay, so then uh, why don't I proceed and then should I or should we respond to the question? No, that that would be excellent. We can hold that one to the end, or uh, if Stephanie would like, she could respond in the in the chat window as well. Yeah, go right ahead. Great. Okay, thank you, um, and apologies for the audio glitch. So, um, as Una mentioned, I'm the director of the Inclusive Design uh, Research Center and the Inclusive Design Institute at OCAD University up here in Canada, and. Um, We've been in existence since 1993, and um, the things to note is that everything and all of the projects that we do are open source, open access, open standards, open data. So all is free and open for anyone to use. And our, um, we have over 18 multi-partner, multi-sector pro proactive research projects. By proactive, I mean we try to provide the building blocks and uh, the tools that are needed to deliver uh, accessible education and other um, accessible online services. The, our definition of inclusive design, and I think somebody asked about wh what is the uh, overlap between uh, UDL or Universal Design for Learning and inclusive design, they, they are very, very cl uh, closely linked. Uh, we uh, define inclusive design as as design that considers the full range of human diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, gender, age, and other forms of human difference. And therefore, we're talking about designing for diversity, which of course encompasses the needs of um, anyone that we define as, as users, or also defined as extreme users within the design community, and that includes individuals with disabilities. And as I mentioned, we try to address the beginning of the development food chain to support integrated accessibility right from the start. We have within this design context a somewhat revised notion of disability because one of the things that we found is that classic definitions of learners with disabilities tends to create what we call the, the uh, doubly marginalized group. Uh, because there are fairly specific requirements regarding cert being certified as um, having a disability and therefore uh, qualifying for services, that often means that there are a number of learners who are neither met by the special education um, provided to those that qualify for those special education services, nor by the standard education system. And so um, our definition within the design context of disability is that disability is a mismatch between the needs of the learner and the educational environment and experience offered. So it's not a personal trait, but a relative condition. And under this definition, um, we make the point that individuals who are classically defined as having a disability may in fact not be experiencing a disability in a certain learning context for a certain learning goal, but others who are not who may have uh, be experiencing barriers just like not having slept, not having reviewed the background material, um, being distracted by children, being extracted by distracted by the environment, having hands busy, eyes busy, are in fact at that time experiencing a disability despite the fact that they are not classically defined as having a disability. And therefore, Accessibility within this design definition um, is equal to the ability of the learning and environment to adjust to the needs of all learners, the flexibility of education of the education environment, curriculum, and delivery. And um, 
we achieve accessibility by optimizing the learning environment for each individual learner. So just like the definition of disability is relative to the learner, the learner context and learner's goal, the accessibility of a resource and experience, a service, is also relative to, uh, to the various conditions and um, users and goals that they wish to achieve. And one of the uh, often relearned tenets of much of the work that we are doing is that learners learn differently. Um, and there are multiple reports, which I will, uh, I will put the URLs and references and citations into the chat window at the end of the session, which uh, show that learning breakdown and dropout occurs when students face barriers to learning, feel disadvantaged by the learning experience offered, or feel that their personal learning needs are ignored. Um, the often relearned lesson is we need to design for diversity. And the an associated um, lesson is that we actually, in this knowledge age, we need diverse learners. So we need to encourage, we not only need to design our learning for diverse learners, but we need to encourage the uh, development and nurturing of diverse learners. Because in the knowledge economy, in the quickly changing transformative times that we're in, we don't need a series of standard learners with a standard set of skills. We, in fact, need learners that have a variety and a diversity of skills. The, there are a number of problems with a one-size-fits-all approach to accessibility. Uh, it excludes learners that do not fit categories. It treat lear treats learners with disabilities as a homogenous group. We ignore the multiplicity, multiplicity of needs and skills that affect learning, and we frequently constrain the design of learning resources, leaving less leeway to address minority needs and non-normative learning styles or approaches. It compromises the learning experience for many of the learners the services are intended to serve, and um, one of the primary things that has uh, resulted in somewhat of an education crisis, certainly in the U.S., but also other jurisdictions, is it ghettoizes education for students with disabilities, which means that it's less sustainable, more costly. So uh, one of the things that uh, we have been attempting to make possible and, and to provide the supports, the infrastructure, the tools for is this the possibility of one size fits one education and um, using, harnessing, capitalizing on open education resources to do this. With one size fits one education, you are optimizing learning for each learner. And the types of learning needs that um, affect learning might include sensory, motor, cognitive, emotional, and social constraints, individual learning styles and approaches, linguistic or cultural preferences, technical, financial, or environmental constraints. So the goal is to make a match with a learner's particular individual requirements. And this is made possible or made um, more possible even <laughs> through the large pool of diverse, flexible resources that is often represented by open education resources. But to make the match, we need um, to be able to do a number of things, transform the resource through styling mechanisms or, or other mechanisms, augment the resource, um, by doing things like adding captioning to video, description, um, transcripts, et cetera, or replace the resource with another resource that addresses the same learning goals but matches the learner's specific access needs. And in order to make this possible, um, we've developed something called the FLOW Project, which is funded by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation with a large feasibility study funded by the U.S. Department of Ed. And this is supported by a global public infrastructure to deliver learning experience that matches each learner's individual needs. It is based upon an ISO standard, the Access for All standard, as it's called, um, ISO 24751, if anyone's interested, um, which is an interoperability standard that provides a common language for describing learner needs and labeling resources that meet those needs. And it, the, Flow project also provides 
support for creating resources amenable to transformation and aug augmentation and support for filling gaps in um, the necessary uh, resource criteria or requirements that would make it accessible to uh, learners with disabilities. So in order to provide this one size fits one uh, approach, we need, first off, information about each learner's access needs. Secondly, information about the learner needs addressed by each resource. Um, the, the first information about each learner's access needs is achieved through a number of learning to learn, metacognition, learning discovery environments where a learner can try out, a learner and their team can try out, experiment with, simulate the various options available to them in terms of learning presentation, in terms of uh, learning approach, in terms of the mode of, uh, the sensory mode, uh, in terms of uh, a variety of options. The, and then that information um, is taken and, uh, it, and translated into machine-readable form so that it can be matched. And there is a feedback mechanism that allows the learner to refine that under their understanding of how they learn best. The second part of it, um, the uh, information about the learner needs addressed by each resource is the second part of the ISO 24751 standard, which is a metadata that labels the resources regarding what needs it, the resource addresses. And this is tied into a large uh, metadata effort to uh, integrate this into schema.org and therefore Google searches and, and other uh, search mechanisms and discovery mechanisms for OER. The third requirement is that we need resources that are amenable to transformation and a pool of alternative equivalent resources. And so this effort um, involves um, authoring supports to create, to support the creation of open education resources that are amenable to transformation. and, and effort to federate the various open education resources uh, so that the, the pool of diverse resources is as large as possible. And then the last part, a method of matching learner needs with appropriate learning ex experience, this is uh, provided by a web service, cloud service, or network service that uh, matches up what the learner requires with the appropriate resource. So this is a somewhat of a, a complex flow diagram that shows the process. As you can see, it begins with the learner need, uh, which is then um, used to find the right resource. The, the, there is an associated learning analytics or feedback cycle, which both allows the match to be refined, the learner's understanding of their learning need to be refined and uh, provides feedback or review to the potential providers or suppliers of uh, the open education resources. The um, piece within this that fits very well within deeper learning initiatives and priorities, certainly within the US, but also in other jurisdictions is um, the various environments where learners can try out a number of uh, qualities or approaches to learning. And this fulfills another uh, knowledge gap in that there is very little known about the, what, what is optimal for learners at the margins. Uh, the learners at the margins are usually uh, eliminated from any educational data set. Uh, they are normed, uh, when the data is normed, they are, uh, they disappear from the data set. Uh, any attempts to uh, reach statistical significance with research directly with these learners is, is very difficult because they are extremely heter heterogeneous and by the time there is sufficient replication of data to reach statistical significance, it, is, it becomes irrelevant. And so an important piece of this approach is that uh, there is a mechanism to gather um, current and useful data on what works best for each individual learner. Uh, there is a video in case people are interested and I can paste that into the, um, uh, or maybe Una can paste it into the uh, 
chat window sure. as well. We don't have time at, at this point to watch it. The other supports that are available to help in the creation of um, accessible open education or transformable education resources and the necessary building blocks for accessible open education resources include a handbook for authors. Um, and the, these supports are also built into a number of OER authoring environments, including Open Author, which is a tool that is, is distributed by ISKME and OER Pub. Um, and uh, there were a number of mentions of um, accessible digital office documents, so uh, Microsoft Word, except, et cetera. There is a step-by-step, screenshot-by-screenshot, very, very hand or very um, detailed and, and practical guide to creating accessible documents for all of the various office documents, uh, including presentations, PowerPoints, uh, PDFs, um, and as well as open source uh, word processor documents at the Accessible Digital Office Document link, which is an, um, an effort that was partially funded by UNESCO. Uh, this is a screenshot that shows the authoring support within um, the open author. As uh, the items are being authored, there are prompts and instructions and links to supporting information um, and help in, uh, with supporting information uh, that appear in the left navigation or um, depending upon how the user wishes to um, uh, display this, the author is prompted as they move through um, checking in and, and producing an open education in uh, also supplying the right stuff to make sure that it is accessible. Um, checking was mentioned, um, the A Checker uh, link provides, it is an effort to try to harmonize amongst the various checkers so that there is no inconsistency between the results of one checker versus another. Um, and it is a free and open accessibility checker for web-based open education resources. The, um, there was uh, some discussion earlier as well about the need for the entire delivery cycle or the entire life cycle of uh, open education resource use or education through open education resources to be considered. And uh, the, the link that is here, and I'm wondering if I can, Una, how, is it possible to sh demonstrate this or not? Um. Um, you can type that into. The, is it? Is um? Is it a video? No, it's a. It's a. I was just uh, thinking of showing the website to show how this works. Well, I, I would encourage people to explore this. Um, uh, there are. It shows both how a learner might uh, play with and simulate. Uh, this is specifically one OER. Uh, which contains video in it. And one of the, the big accessibility challenges is that uh, video players and viewers are frequently not very accessible. And this provides a fully accessible video player, which provides a caption, a description, a transcript, and allows you to navigate through the video using the transcript. It also has on the, if you follow the link, on the upper um, right-hand corner, a small uh, component that provides a drop-down window which offers a number of learner options. Once those are selected, um, you have the option of creating a learner preference set which is then applied to further open education resources that you may wish to view. And so um, a learner can uh, create uh, a preference set, refine a preference set, and uh, the player browser um, is accessible. Uh, the other efforts um, that are underway include um, support in moving from Flash to HTML5 for simulations and games. Flash provides very, very brittle accessibility. Frequently, efforts that are invested in making it accessible uh, break because it is a complex system and dependent upon a number of stages and steps that can easily uh, 
be updated. And so Flash is not uh, the most stable place to, or stable way to provide accessible simulations and games. And uh, within the Fluid and Flow project, we provide help in creating HTML animation simulations and games. Um, we also have an effort, and within the handbook, you will see um, examples of how to create an EPUB 3 ac accessible textbook addressing the, a number of the gnarly issues that happen within textbook, including um, math and math, uh, scientific notation, uh, tables, charts, graphs, uh, embedded videos, embedded animations, etc. Um, there is there are components and uh, toolkits and building blocks for creating mobile uh, displays for OER and responsive design that um, ensures that your OER will display correctly in a variety of mobile platforms. And uh, we're working on um, inclusively designed MOOCs with a number of the um, MOOC platforms that are out there. And so I, I would point you to uh, both the Flow project and the Fluid Wiki. As I said, everything is open source, open access, and um, is being developed by a large open source community. So you're all also very, very welcome to help out and to contribute anything that, that you feel may be helpful to the larger community. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that uh, developing um, inclusively designed or accessible one-size-fits-one open education resources um, means that you reach more learners, there's easier updating, easier internationalization, better browser and device compatibility. You reach doubly marginalized learners, as I mentioned um, at the beginning of my talk. Uh, there is greater resource longevity, and um, you support learning to learn, which results in deeper learning. And I'll pass it over to you, Una. Thanks very much, Yuta. Um, <laughs> um, wonderful presentation, uh, both Yuta and Anna. And um, we are coming on the top of the hour. We have a couple of minutes for questions. And we've had some lively discussions in um, the chat window. Um, is anyone out there on speaker who would like to speak up? Um, if not, um, Jim has been raising a certain point about learning styles and um, that faculty sometimes think of um, accessibility um, and um, adapting for individual users as uh, part of a learning styles um, effort. And there's been some recent discrediting, I think, of learning styles. Um, and I think that that may be contributing to some um, maybe lack of engagement on faculty's parts. And Jim also made a point about how students sometimes identify themselves as having a specific learning style, and then they become less open to um, other modalities. And um, Yuta or, or Anna, would you like to address that? Yeah, I, I would love to address that. Certainly, um, when we're talking about UDL or Universal Design for Learning and uh, we are not, I mean, learning styles is one fairly simplistic um, framework that I, I agree there is, I, I think one of, has not um, benefited very much from a lot of the hype. I think the, the more um, pertinent and uh, relevant information is um, the information or the research that's gone into deeper learning and, and universal design for learning. Um, which goes far beyond uh, this, these sort of categories that have been defined within um, the learning style framework. Um, but I, I agree. I mean, it, it's unfortunate that uh, this um, notion of individualized learning has been uh, sort of overshadowed by uh, learning styles. Uh, the um, the learning discovery and uh, learning to learn environments that um, we've been developing and that others have been developing and contributing to um, go far, far beyond uh, the, the categories or, or the classifications that are within learning style. Uh, thank you, Yuta. Um, we, we had some interesting um, discussion about qualitative um, uh, 
uh, uh, data or um, tagging associated with OER and how that um, is very helpful for search capabilities. And we obviously we, we need additional um, what what is common more commonly called metadata to make um, OER more searchable from both an accessibility point of view, but also as Stephanie mentioned um, from a quality point of view. And um, you you mentioned something about um, Paradata, which um, sounds like an extension of the idea of metadata. Did you want to elaborate on that a little? Right. So Paradata is um, an effort that is, I guess, supported by a number of organizations and uh, Department of Ed um, initiatives as well. Paradata is basically data related to the usage and quality and um, usefulness of a particular resource. And um, one of the things that we've done is, uh, and a number of other efforts have done is just to extend that even further into data about the effectiveness of um, the resource given a specific learner requirement or need. Uh, so uh, I, I would refer you to um, LRMI and the Learning Registry and uh, for information specifically about Paradata, the I, I actually and I while I'm I've got the speaker on uh, there there was a notion of uh, learners declaring a specific learning style and then not being open to uh, various learning experiences and I think one of the things that uh, we frequently stress is that um, the optimal learning environment for a learner is not a comfortable learning environment, but something that is that provides an optimal challenge. Of course, um, the and so the the just learning discovery and, and uh, simulations and experiments that the learner goes through um, very much make that point that it isn't uh, you, you, it's not to restrict what you're exposed to. It's not to keep you in the place that you are, but to optimally challenge you in such a way that, that you can move forward. But there are um, specific barriers that are not adaptable. So if I'm blind, I am never uh, challenging me to be able to see something is not going to be of benefit. Um, but uh, certainly the, the, if I have, anyways, the, um, you get the, the analogy. So uh, the point is well made that this is not to create a comfortable environment uh, where there's no progress or there's no challenge for a learner. It's to create an, a setup and a configuration of learning that optimally um, moves the learner forward. Thank you, Yuta. We are getting, um, we are a few minutes over now. I want to give um, Dr. Anna Gruzenska a, a chance for any closing remarks that she would like to make. Um, and if there's any last questions um, from anyone, please go ahead and um, type those in the window while Anna concludes. Anna? Yeah, just to uh, follow up from, uh, from what Yuta was uh, saying, I think the, well, first of all, the, the notion of reasonable adjustments and creating and sharing resources that do not introduce any additional and unnecessary hurdles I think that should be uh, that should be the uh, uh, the key uh, and also to uh, reiterate uh, what I was uh, saying earlier I mean one of the beautiful thing about uh, openness is that it Anna, could you speak up a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Uh, right, is that any better? Uh, yeah, that's perfect. I mean, just to conclude, one of the uh, one of the key features uh, of openness and open educational resources is that it does allow learners to to find something that will meet. Uh, the learning needs uh, and the, the learning criteria that they that they are working with, but at the same time, as a community, we should be working towards removing the un unnecessary barriers. Yeah, that, that's a that's a very good point. Well, I 
And thank you, thank you once again to Yuta and Anna for joining us this morning. And I want to thank um, our um, our attendees as well, and those of you who are, will be looking at this um, in the future virtually. Um, and at this point, um, unless there is any other questions, I think we're going to sign off. And I hope you all have a wonderful day.